In the years leading up to and then during World War II, millions of paintings and other cultural artifacts were stolen from their rightful owners by the Nazi Third Reich. Most often, that meant from Jewish families and private collections, as well as from museums and other institutions. Getting those objects returned to their owners has been an incredibly complex undertaking. Canada, for instance, has no specific law covering Holocaust-era restitution. With us to take a closer look, we welcome, in Boston, Massachusetts, Nicholas O'Donnell, a partner at the law firm Sullivan & Worcester, and author of A Tragic Fate, Law and Ethics in the Battle Over Nazi Looted Art. In Hamilton, Ontario, Christine Braun, collection manager at the Art Gallery of Hamilton. And in the Dover Court neighborhood of Ontario's capital city, there's Sarah Angel, Nazi-era restitution scholar and founder of Art Canada Institute. And it's great to have you three on TVO tonight. Uh, this is a subject I suspect is going to come as news to a lot of people. So let's get some background in place before we dive in. Sarah, to you first. I gather... I gather there's sort of three categories of art that the Nazis were interested in seizing eight plus decades ago. Maybe we can start there. What are those three categories? Sure, Steve. Thanks for that question. Um, when the Nazis came to power in 1933, there was a cultural policy that they put into place um, where they were very concerned about art, very interested in it, and where they began seizing art for themselves. To talk about the three categories that you mentioned, there was a group of art, of, of paintings that the Nazis wanted for themselves. These were works that were they considered part of the ideal of their Aryan aesthetics, works by Rembrandt, works by Vermeer. And these were works that they seized from private collectors as well as museums. Then there was a work, a group of works uh, that Nazis declared as degenerate works of art. These were works that were more contemporary, more modern works such as expressionist works of art, works as impressionist works of art, um, works that they saw not fitting into the Aryan ideal. And what they did with these works is rather than seize them for their own collections, what they did was they knew they had value uh, in other parts of the world, largely in North America. So they figured out a way through a sophisticated group of, of dealers that were working for them to be able to sell off these works internationally. And that is how so many works of Nazi looted art ended up in North America. And finally, Steve, there was a third group that of, of art that uh, fell into the prey of the Nazis during the uh, Nazi era regime. And those were works that were owned by Jewish collectors that the Nazis didn't particularly value to sell off abroad, um, but which the Nazis said that Jews could not own because they were Jewish, works that belonged uh, to gallery, Jewish gallery owners, for example, uh, or works that people had in their own private collections. And these were works, a lot of works, I would say the vast majority, that were lost by people who were sort of in the middle class and who had to either forcibly sell their works of art, or these works um, may have been uh, used as a way for somebody to, um, be able to pay for food, uh, be able to uh, fend for themselves in a circumstance of loss because of persecution, because they were anti-Semitic. Okay, with that background now in place, Nicholas, I'm going to bring you in because we want to move to the year 1998. All of this has happened in the past, but in 1998, we get something called the Washington Principles. What are they? The Washington Principles came out of a conference organized by the U.S. State Department uh, called the the Washington Conference on Nazi-era assets, Holocaust-era assets. And late in the conference, as the, com as the delegates had been discussing things like gold and deposit accounts in Europe and insurance policies, it came up that the Nazis had, of course, looted so much art and perhaps this ought to be addressed. What came out of it were what we now call the Washington Principles, which were a series of aspirational goals about how to deal with claims for which there might not be an obvious legal remedy, for which their limitations period may have been uh, have expired, for which proof may not uh, have, have met the normal standard, and to urge the 44 countries that participated in the Washington Conference to come up with what they called fair and just solutions. Um, that took a number of forms, and it still, as I'm sure we'll discuss somewhat in the eye of the beholder, but it started a process of countries in Europe in particular trying to, to create 
avenues by which art in their national collections could be restituted. And a quick follow-up, Nicholas, uh, are these principles binding, and if so, on whom? They are not binding. They are not an international treaty ratified in the normal course. And so they are still very much, as I said, to call it aspirational, kind of a, a moral signpost, if you will, to urge participating countries to reach beyond strict legal definitions in confronting this difficult topic. And how many countries have signed on? So there were 44 countries at the Washington conference. Uh, I forget the exact number at the Terezine follow-up conference in 2009, but it was similar, give or take a couple. Okay, so we're at 44 anyway, and, and uh, presumably maybe a dozen or so NGOs beyond that. Yes. That sounds right. Okay, good. All right, Christine, now we bring you in here. The notion, the notion that there may be Nazi looted paintings hanging on the walls of even the Art Gallery of Hamilton, who knows? Was that something in the 1990s or 20 years ago that, uh, that anybody would have considered within the realm of possibility? Uh, not us, certainly. Um, I can speak as uh, you know, a medium-sized institution with a predominantly Canadian collection. Um, to put it in perspective, in 1998, we had 7,000 works. 5,000 of those were Canadian. So, of course, we were aware of the creation of the Washington Principles, um, and we did have smaller uh, pockets in the collection featuring American, British, Dutch, French, German art, but those had been historically collected uh, for the way that they informed Canadian art. So we really had a Canadian focus. So it really wasn't on our radar to be 100% honest, and I can imagine that was the case with a lot of similar institutions. All right, Sarah, do we have a rough ballpark figure as to how much... The Nazi looted art may in fact be in Canada today? We do, and, and here's a way to look at it. In 1998, after the Washington Principles, it became, the Washington Principles took place because 50 years after the Second World War, uh, cl files, f classified files were declassified, made accessible, and all of a sudden, people started realizing um, works that had been lost in, in by the Nazis could be reclaimed. So they had access to information. Second of all, claims started being made in the United States between 1995 and 1998 for Nazi-looted works of art in museums. So the Washington Principles comes into place to say, wait a minute, people are making claims. There are works of Nazi-looted art that are in North American museums. And the figure, Steve, that you're talking about is, is when the Nazis were in power, about 25% of works of art in Europe were in play, somehow touched by Nazi hands, either plundered, either confiscated. Um, and it is estimated that today there are over 100,000 works of art, of Nazi looted art, that still haven't been returned to their owner. So the, the issue is very much out there. You're showing a an image of the Monuments Men, who many will know from the George Clooney film. After the Second World War, the Allied forces tried to return as much art as they could to those who had lost it. But the situation that took place is that so many individuals who had lost art had either perished during the Holocaust, and today we're on the show because it is Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. So those people had perished or records had been lost. And what ended up happening is the Monuments Men returned works of art to different countries where the art had been seized from. And those countries, uh, for a period, tried to return the works of art, but as, as I said, many people had perished and were unable to claim them. And then what they did was they gave them to museums to be able to put those works into museum collections and on museum walls. And that is how we get to the situation in the place we are now. Hmm. Nicholas, if there are 100,000 pieces out there that come under the category of what we're discussing here tonight, uh, you know, I have to infer that there are lots of countries that are really good guys about returning art to where it belongs, and there are some who are not so good about doing this. Can you make us a bit of a checklist here? So I think it's fair to say that there are, there are many countries that, particularly since the Washington Principles, have tried um, to varying degrees to engage with this topic, to figure out, as Sarah said, what to do with large numbers of works that ended up in the possession of the national government because either the willpower trailed off in the 1950s or the trail went cold 
and the claims process in the 40s and 50s didn't lead to a restitution. The Washington Conference led to the Netherlands, Germany, Austria, the United Kingdom, and France to create more formal procedures to deal with claims in the present day. Um, but a lot of countries have not tried at all. Uh, there are a lot of countries that participated in the Washington Conference, let alone after the war, that have really made no effort at all and, and that are very hostile to the topic entirely. Come on, Nicholas, name names. Well, I think Hungary is the most egregious offender. I think Poland, under the current government, has become increasingly hostile and has turned claimants into uh, a way to sort of spin the narrative and accuse claimants of besmirching Poland, while at the same time seeking aggressively uh, and, and justifiably works that were taken from Polish museums and ended up elsewhere as a result of either the German or the Soviet army. Sarah, what's your view on how well or not Canada is participating in all of this. Steve, I think Canada is uh, at a record all-time low in their participation of this and um, or in their participation of uh, properly restituting Nazi looted art. Now, I should say that there have only been four cases in Canada that have taken place. Um, one at the National Gallery of Canada, where actually its practice was exemplary, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the Hamilton Museum of Arts that Christine has talked about. And then at the Art Gallery of Ontario, there was a case uh, where a painting was restituted in very late 2020, um, the news of which was broken in around January. And what came out was that the Art Gallery of Ontario restituted a painting to a claimant in England, but no process was followed, uh, no public process. Nicholas mentioned England, um, France, the Netherlands, the European, five European countries who have a very accurate public process, a very transparent one where before any work is restituted, um, a, a serious investigation is made that often takes a number of years. Um, and then a recommendation is usually made to a cultural minister uh, who then decides whether the work should be restituted or not. So in other words, there is a really, really deep dive into what the provenance of a work of art is before it's given back. And the reason, Steve, that that is so necessary is because um, in my view and in the view of many, the importance of restitution is about the art, but it is about also the art representing the lives of those who suffered, uh, who perished and who were persecuted during the Nazi era, during the Holocaust. And so, Provenance research and an accurate restitution is so important because ultimately it is an honor of the memory of those who uh, were persecuted in the past and it is a correcting of what went wrong. Understood. Christine, I'm sure everybody listening carefully would have heard Sarah mention your institution in that last answer as a place involved in all of this. And so I want to ask you about something that happened in 2003 when I gather a letter written in German, came to the Art Gallery of Hamilton, saying what? Uh, saying that there was a claim uh, that a work in our collection, Portrait of a Lady by Johannes Cornelius Verschbrunk, um, there was a claim being made. The family of a woman named Alma Salmonson was claiming that the work was, um, did in fact belong to them. Um, so we were shocked, surprised, mixed with disbelief. Um, as you say, it landed on the doorstep. It was in German. It took us a while to digest what was inside uh, the letter. It was complete with, you know, a lot of archival documents substantiating uh, the life of the painting and Alma's trials. Um, and, you know, all we knew about the work was that we had purchased it in 1987 at a very public venue, um, an auction of Sotheby's in New York City of important old master paintings. So there was that sense that this couldn't be the same painting. We, you know, we understood Verspronk as an artist did repeat um, subject matter. He would paint variations on the same sitter. So once we sort of realized what was happening, we, we decided to take a good look at that possibility. Um, what happened then was a, a real education for all of us. Well, okay, let's let's keep we going with the about, story here. Um, yeah, you you presumably have to undertake an investigation okay. <laughs> to to uh, understand the provenance or the origin of the painting and how long did that take and what did you find? It 
took us a long time. You know, um, going through the initial documents, you know, we knew when we had purchased our painting in 87, um, but here we learned a tale of Alma Salmonson, Alma and Albert, a wealthy Jewish family living in Germany, um, uh, people of means, having properties. They had a fine art collection of 25 works. Albert died in the early 30s. In 1939, Alma made it known her wish to flee to England with her three children. Um, and of course, her goods were confiscated. She was allowed to keep just a small amount of those. Um, you know, her entire belongings were sold and she did not see any, any compensation for that. Um, she sent her kids ahead to England and then she packed her remaining belongings in three containers. Um, and she lists in her inventory out of her artworks, she had eight paintings and two sculpture. Um, and one of the paintings is listed as Portrait of a Lady by Johannes Versprunk. So Alma fled to England, obviously fearing for her well-being, but her belongings never made it there. Hmm. So where's the painting today and what ultimately did you guys decide to do? Oh, um, well, I'll, it was a long road. Uh, it took us about 12 years. Um, the reasons for that, uh, you know, are kind of mundane in a way. Um, you know, as I mentioned, of correspondence would come to us in German. We would translate, we would seek counsel. We would write back requesting certain information from the, the claimants. Um, you know, at no time was there any barrier on either side except for geography uh, and time and language. Um, there was a period of six years where we did not hear anything and we thought perhaps that um, the claim was um, sort of was not going forward. But then we received a renewal in 2011 stating, you know, apologizing, stating that the lead council had, had um, passed away. Uh, and then things just started moving again. Um, we did the provenance, our curator of European art at the time, Patrick Shaw Cable, um, while we could not get any information from Sotheby's about the seller, Patrick was able to use his um, connections. He had worked at the Cleveland Museum of Art previously. And he found that the work had actually um, been in the possession of Johnny Van Heften, who was a dealer in London, contacted Mr. Van Heften, who said, yes, I'm the one who put it to Sotheby's for sale. And I acquired it two years ago from a runner, which was a term I learned during this whole thing. I learned many things. Um, a runner, and he only had a last name for that person. So at that point, you know, we realized even though there was still a gap in the provenance research, it was too compelling to ignore that this was in fact the same portrait that belonged to Alma and her family. And where's the portrait now? Oh, my apologies. Uh, it's in, well, the family is based in uh, Philadelphia, but I believe now she was going to a home in New Mexico um, a holiday home. That's where they took her. Gotcha. Uh, Nicholas, this is, of course, just one example of myriad examples of what happens when a painting becomes at the center of an investigation. And I guess I want to find out from you, on whom do you think the onus is to figure all this out? The victims and their descendants to investigate or museums and galleries to investigate and ultimately, quote unquote, do the right thing? Well, I think as a practical matter, the onus remains on the families, and I think that's one of the big challenges. The fact is, because of the way works were dispersed both back to countries in Europe as well as into the private market with destinations unknown over the course of the intervening decades, families often don't know where to start. Families often don't even necessarily know what they lost or that they lost anything. And so it is quite often that things are sort of sitting in plain sight that if someone could connect the dots, the conversation could begin. This is not a complicated, uh, th this is a complicated question to answer because then the question becomes where do the resources come from to, to forward that conversation? But I think there is good news and there is bad news both. American museum associations have urged their institutions to undertake research proactively. I was an employee of a museum in the late 1990s that did that. That's one of the ways I got into this work. And a lot of museums, I think, deserve a lot of credit for doing that. And the challenge continues to, to find those resources and find that energy. 
Now, in terms of the work that you do, would you look at this story from the Art Gallery of Hamilton and say, this was a story that ultimately had a happy ending? I think, I you know, it's hard for me to, to, to judge the circumstances of others, but it seems like the claimants and the family found peace with the outcome. Um, I'm sure it was a difficult decision for the museum, which I credit it for, you know, engaging with in good faith and, and, and working hard at it. So I would say yes. Okay, Sarah, let me get you back in here. And in doing so, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up a picture here of what was a Nazi looted painting called Still Life with Flowers by Jan von Kessel. This, is, this goes back to 1660. And this also, this painting, got into the middle of a huge controversy about its provenance and where it ought to be. And, um, well, you know all about this. Why don't you tell us the story behind this one? I, I do, Steve, and I know about it because I wrote an editorial about it for the Globe and Mail. And um, the reason I did was because as somebody who teaches on art restitution and Nazi looted art, um, I was fascinated by this case because what happened was that the Art Gallery of Ontario restituted the painting to a claimant in England. And right after they returned the painting to England, it left Canada, uh, the Art Gallery of Ontario put up on their website a provenance history for the painting. And in that provenance history, it included the name Gallery Stern, 1937. So uh, Nicholas had mentioned that often claimants don't know that they are looking for a work of art. And that was the case with this instance. There is an organization, a 20-year organization that's based in Montreal called the Max Stern Restitution Project. And that project uh, was named after a very famous Canadian art dealer. He was an art dealer for Emily Carr, and his name was Max Stern. And, in, and he, in 1937, lost over uh, 300 works of art from his Dusseldorf gallery. He was forced by the Nazis to sell him and sell the works. Actually, Nicholas wrote a great book, and he devotes a chapter to Max Stern, which gives you an indication of how well Max Stern is known internationally uh, and how revered the Max Stern Restitution Project is. In any case, uh, the Art Gallery of Ontario puts onto its website that the painting had been part of the Stern Gallery in Dusseldorf in 1937. So although the Max Stern Restitution Project never knew that this was a painting that it was looking for, when it saw that piece of information on the AGO website, it contacted the AGO and said, what can you tell us about this painting? Would you, be, would you help us? We want to learn more. Um, the claimant who came forth that you returned the painting to, what information did they provide in order to give you solid evidence that it was theirs? And then what the AGO did was something that was really surprising, which is that they just took off that piece of information from their website. They essentially just expunged that piece of information from history without any explanation, which Steve, unfortunately, is a major museum, um, uh, you know, no, no, you would just never do something like that. Well, you said they botched it. You used the word botched. Um, they they botched it. I mean, it, it just, it, it one thing with provenance information is you have to have complete transparency about what is going on. Um, and the AGO has continued to not offer any kind of transparency. Um, your producer told me, Steve, that the AGO's representatives were invited to be on this program. And I believe if they were really committed to this issue, they would be here in a discussion with us tonight. Hmm. We should say, just for the record, incidentally, that the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario did tell us that this is a complex and evolving situation. They say they've got a new internal committee that is reviewing their provenance policies, and I guess we should stay tuned. Okay, N Nicholas, let me give you the last word on this, because I can imagine there's some people watching this saying, there are lots of problems in the world, and uh, we're trying to right the wrongs of something that happened seven, eight, nine decades ago. And what's wrong with just sort of letting sleeping dogs lie and who gives a damn about any of this anyway? The response to those folks who think that way, Nicholas, is what? The response is that everybody who was victimized by this horrible historic crime responded to it in different ways. And I would say, in my experience, the most common way that people responded to it, particularly right after the war, was to move on with their lives as best they could and often didn't have the means or the knowledge or the 
or the access to to push these things. But the fact is, these were people's belongings. And and when people ask me that question about why is this worth the effort, I, I remind them that most of these works are not market setting multi million dollar paintings. Most of these works were objects of beauty that people had in their homes because they liked them. And I, I respond to that by saying, imagine the things that, that bring you happiness. And imagine if the worst people you know were allowed to come into your home and just take them from you. And, and, and would you just let that go? I, I don't think I would. That's a good answer. And with that, Nicholas, Christine, and Sarah, I want to thank you very much for coming onto the agenda tonight and uh, giving us some real insight into uh, a most unusual and complicated situation. Thanks so much to you all. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.